Augustine says, in all matters of this kind, it is not the nature of the things we use, but our reason for using them and our matter of seeking them that make what we do either praiseworthy or blamable. That's the Jesus teaching. It's not the event. It's not the substance. It's not what goes into your mouth, Jesus says, that defiles you. It's your mouth. That's what I think Augustine is trying to say here. Augustine is saying that we're less concerned about the body than we are about the effect on the soul. The issue is uh, desire. Inordinate desire of any form from a biblical perspective, and this is where the Bible is very clear and explicit, inordinate desire leads often to ruin. It flows from the issue of gluttony. Gluttony is associated with inordinate, inappropriate, unchallenged desire. Um, Dante's Inferno. I think I read that. Uh, I tried it again, Anne Milton, in a, in a real self-righteous goal of four or five years ago, and I go, I can't do this. So I just stick with Russian novels. Uh, Dante's Inferno, uh, Dante says that gluttons go to something he calls the third circle of hell. And, uh, which, by the way, the third circle of hell for Dante was not uh, the worst place. The worst uh, w remains for other discussion, but it was more tar terrible Gluttons were in a much worse situation than lusters, for example, which will he ought to come back next week. Um, but lust, said Dante, was associated with other people. Gluttony is associated with a slab of bacon. And for some reason, uh, Dante thought that uh, another human being somehow had more merit for deception or deceit than a slab of bacon or a Krispy Kreme, whatever it is you're, you're into, okay? So, um, what is the point of all this? The point here from the medieval teaching of the church is that the devil attacks always at the point of perceived need. Listen to the story we started off with Jesus in, in Matthew 4. He had been out in the isolated for 40 days. Let's just trust Jesus was hungry. And Satan tells Jesus, I'll give you some food. And Jesus says, I'm not going to respond to that. So that's, he attacked where the obvious need was. Medievals associated much greater evil with the mouth, uncontrolled restraint with the mouth than they did, for example, with lust. In our culture, lust is encouraged. Gluttony, you'll have to decide for yourself how we respond to gluttony. But lust, I think, is encouraged. All you have to do is, have you noticed they're starting to prep for the fall TV series? And look at what they're selling. Do you learn a storyline? And I, I probably ought to hold this until next week. But when I'm sleeping on Sunday afternoon watching CBS and golf, and all of a sudden I see a heaving, chested woman in a bra, I wake right up. It just catches my attention. And uh, evidently I'm not the only one, because that sells television shows. They, I don't know anything about the storyline. I just see this woman in ecstasy, and I, hmm. I might want to check this out, and, uh, but I don't because I'm married to Pat. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think I ought to teach next week's lesson. <laughs> Paul, it's yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the fact is, of the seven deadly sins, there are some that are actually flaunted or encouraged our, in our culture. And certainly, uh, how we respond to gluttony is, I don't know. St. Thomas 
had the daughters of gluttony. And the daughters of gluttony were excessive and unseemly joy. You got me, I don't know. Okay, loutishness, I know about that. Okay, loutishness. So I just spent a week golfing with my father. Uh, we know about loutishness. Okay, uncleanness. These are all connected. These are the daughters of gluttony. <clears throat> I'll just pass the next one here. Okay. <laughs> And this is it. the last one. The, uh, the last daughter of gluttony is uncomprehending dullness of... Uh. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. I have never heard of that before. So, gluttony. Gluttony, however, is more than self-indulgence. And that's one of the subtleties I want us to, to grasp here today. What do I mean by that? There's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus tells that story. And the rich man obviously has uh, is indulged. He has lots of things. And he says, thank God I'm not like this wretched sinner. Uh, and the rich man has all of this blessing. But it's not merely about overindulgence. The problem with the rich man is the hard-heartedness and the insensitivity to the needs that are around him. Sort of goes back to Bob's point during, you know, the whole issue of, of the heat. Uh, you know, I'm glad, glad that I've got air conditioning. I'm glad for that. Uh, but it's the rich man in Lazarus that talks about this incredible insensitivity of this person to the other person's need. And that is connected, says the church and our, our tradition, to the issue of gluttony. It's not just about wolfing down crab. I've been eating crab lately. I've been on both coasts. So, so uh, I decided that there are any number of miserable deaths that people can die. And I've decided if I'm going to go down in a miserable death, I want to go down to gout. Okay, okay, so that's my goal. That's right. And I understand it's incredibly painful, but at least as it's going down any number of ways, that, that crab was, that was pretty good. So, okay. Um, the, the, the church said that gluttony is a robber. Uh, it is a robber. Augustine said that gluttons or rich people were either robbers by or if they inherited their wealth, this is going back to the, the story of uh, the rich and Lazarus, that they either inherited, or if they did inherit their wealth, they are the son of a robber. Beware of it. Society is a concern for the, uh, for the matter of gluttony. How can gluttony be a sin against society? Is it just a private one? Yes, overconsumption affects other people. It is a sin against the neighbor. Now, I, I don't want to venture out too far here because most of you know I'm pretty much politically gutless, at least in terms of my public ministry. But when a nation consumes the amount of energy, for example, that we consume around the globe, uh, doesn't that strike you as troublesome? I'm not saying that we can't afford it. I am saying, is it right? Uh, I read an article several years ago in the, in the uh, Wall Street Journal about bandwidth, about that the United States commands so much Internet bandwidth. We demand it. And when we take it, we take it away from others because we've, we can. But the fact that we can doesn't make it right. We supersize everything. Supersize, yes. Okay, Gregory the Great and St. Thomas Aquinas uh, spoke of eating too soon, too much, too avidly, too richly, too daintily. I think that's important because that's something different than just being, you know, uh, who was um, the life of Brian? Mr. Creosote? Mr. Creosote. Mr. Creosote. Oh, mint. Oh, okay. okay. So we associate gluttony with Mr. Creosote in, in the Monty Python series, but... but what, what we're trying to say here is that part of gluttony is this word right here, too. It's not so much 
obsessive concern with the amount, but overly concerned with diets, being fixated on food, carbs, fat, ingredients. This is a danger. This, when, when your life centers on this, you might weigh 100 pounds. But that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a problem with gluttony, the classics would say. C.S. Lewis described in the screw tape letters that gluttony was simply self-centeredness. And then he has this fantastic illustration of this particular little old woman. And I, I want to read you this quote from the screw tape letters. I think this is magnificent. Um, and remember in the screw tape letters, it is one devil talking to another devil. So it's, it's trying to, how you do your ministry of devilsome in the demonic. So Lewis writes in, in, in the screw tape letters, uh, with respect to this woman who is very fussy. But what do quantities matter, Screwtape writes, provided we can use a human belly and palate to produce querulousness, impatience, uncharitableness, and self-concern. Glubos, he is one of the demons, has this old woman well in hand, meaning he's got her. She is a positive terror to hostesses and servants. She's always turning from what has been offered her to say with a demure and little sign and smile, oh, please, please, all I want is a cup of tea weak. Oh, but not too weak. The teeniest, weeniest bit of really crisp toast. You see, because what she wants is smaller and less costly than what has set before her, before her, she recognizes as gluttony her determination to get what she wants, however troublesome it may be to others. She believes she's being temperate when in truth she is a pain in the neck and self-centered. That's gluttony, says C.S. Lewis. She may eat 800 calories a day, but she is a glutton, says C.S. Lewis. You ever think of it that way? So what is the cure? Gluttony and lust require the most creative cures, since the early church father John Cassian. The 21st century trouble is this. And I'm, I'm making a case here. It's not the sin con we're concerned about, gluttony. It's the fat. That's where the church is today. We don't necessarily, we're not alarmed at the seven deadly sin called gluttony. We don't like what it does to our waistline. So we go, oh, this is awful. But are protesting too much. Our beauty, it's not our relationship with God that is our concern, claims Williman, and I think he's on to something. It's the precious life he's given us. That's what the seven deadly sin is about. It's not how we look. The person who is a luster, one who lusts, may go a lifetime undiscovered. But the obvious glutton, we can all see, can't we? We're more concerned about our waistline than the state of our soul. If I had the dedication of people in the Church of Jesus Christ to their spiritual well-being as much as their routine workout at the YMCA or the health club, we'd have a much more powerful presence in the community. People never miss the why or their exercise or their run haven't opened their Bible for a lifetime. Fat used to be a sign of blessing. I'm sorry, I don't have a very good... Paul Rubens, Flemish artist, uh, have you noticed how women have changed uh, since 1960 in the United States? Uh, look at Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe. And uh, just compare that to the sex symbols of today in our culture. I don't know, how, how much do you think Marilyn Monroe weighed in that movie, Pat? 160, 150? Right. Uh, and that's Paul Rubens. Uh, 
You see, women in medieval art, they don't look like they look today. Fat used to be considered a blessing. If you were fat, it's because you were rich and God had blessed you. Just look at medieval art. That's called The Judgment at Paris uh, by Rubens. It's an, it, it illustrates the, uh, the, the female form in the 17th century. If I'm fat, the medieval person would say, God is blessing me. Yet today in the 21st century, starvation is a, is a huge issue. And the USA is the fattest, we're the fattest people on earth. Even the skinny ones. Eating disorders. Clearly something is going on in the soul more than simply how much you eat. I was in a therapy <coughs> class when I was a chaplain in prison and we had a guy who was going through a divorce and while he was going through the divorce he put on 50 pounds and he didn't have room for 50 pounds. But I remember the therapist saying, uh, putting on padding there for a painful life, which I thought was a very harsh statement. But that therapist, a Christian, understood something that was going on in that person's life. And, you know, sometimes you starve yourself, sometimes you pad yourself when you're going through stress. Something that we can grapple, though, this matter, is we can grapple with the whole issue of gluttony by the grace of God. But it is a matter of two. Too much, too little, too dainty, and then gluttonizing. Life's necessities become um, abused and in response to life's threats. I am suggesting, as the early church does, that like all seven deadly sins, it's a moral issue. It's not simply a dietary issue. There's something deep going on there. And this is what the biblical and the medieval church understood that I don't think we do. Maybe it's time to consider that it's not simply the health issue, which by the way, I think nobody's arguing against the health issues, but the moral implications. It's time merely to connect the waistline and the soul together. Maybe it's time for us to be aware of compassion to the people who are grappling with these challenges, but also a, a certain uh, revulsion or resistance to it as, uh, as we go forward. Gluttony is as unacceptable as any of the seven deadly sins. Gluttony is not function merely of your weight or your waistline. You can be slender and be a glutton. That was C.S. Lewis's point. Last line, sin is always linked not to what we do, but to who we are. Peace be with you.